Hello and welcome to Loving Legacy. I'm your host, Richard Baum, and this time I'm joined by Nico Kreinen. Is that right? I said it right? Yeah, that's totally right. Thank you. Um, good to meet you. Good, good to meet you again. Maybe you could introduce yourself to everybody and um, then we can discuss our topic. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, so I'm Nico and I've been working in the software industry for a while. I've been doing a lot of product development. Well, I say development as part of a product. For quite some years, I had a nice experience of going from absolutely uh, nothing to a good working product with a lot of people using it worldwide. So that was a really cool journey. But also been in somewhat bigger companies in uh, what they call the servant leadership role. But I really also have a deep technical understanding. You, you, your background is development though, would you say? Yeah, On the, uh, a developer. So. My view is always very broad because I want a complete successful software solution on the whole. So um, I need to know a lot, a lot of stuff on a lot of different topics, uh, yeah. but the field is too huge. You can't know everything. So, uh, but still I'm surprised sometimes how much I know on specific stuff <laughs> anyway. Okay. And you work for yeah. a company called Luminous, is that right? Yeah. It's a consultancy in uh, Holland called Luminous. Yeah. And then Luminous as a whole is a bit bigger. So you also have a lot of other colleagues who are Pretty much all of them very smart people so uh there's a lot of people around you that you can uh, lean on and i think that's a really nice uh, combination and we met first uh end of last year i think november or december time there was a yeah. domain driven design uh workshop so you you organize the meetups as well don't you for ddd nl yeah i knew about the meetup for a while and i was always interested in ddd because i think there's a lot of value in it it's somehow it seems that in our industry only Seniors and architects, etc., level are are getting in touch with uh, domain-driven design at some point, and I think that's a waste because there's a lot of value in there that also uh, juniors, etc., could benefit from. They just didn't encounter the problems yet that the, that you need DDD to solve, right? That is useful for <laughs> pretty much everything you do. So one of the things I really wanted to do is trying to lower yes. that learning curve. The workshops really to help people experience firsthand what kind of things you can do to take small steps, making that big change and to force yourself into a mindset, into a way of working that helps you do that. No, I, lo I loved it. I really enjoyed the workshop. I went along again this week. And again, I really appreciated the effort that was put in there because it was, as you say, and he, he mentioned something that you just said as well, like about how a lot of the time the terminology or the, yeah, don't mention DDD, I think it was part of his closing words. Yeah, yeah. Because it does tend to put people off because there seems to be this kind of, idea that the learning curve is quite steep. So we might come yeah. across it as a software engineer day to day and overcome it somehow. But when you see it written down, you go, oh yeah, maybe that's a big problem that I'll come into. Where can I fit this, fit this into my way of working? But yeah, whereas great. probably you already, you've already experienced this a bunch of time, but yeah, if you don't know all the terminology, then you don't recognize it. And then some of the ways stuff is described stays very abstract. So then I try mm. to make it very concrete by just letting people experience it in code. So yeah, you mentioned visualization there as well. We're through event storming and we talked about the other night, things about example mapping um, and we did some domain modeling or pieces, pieces of these. Um, these are, aren't activities that you do by yourselves. They're really all about collaboration, aren't they? Yeah, because uh, in the end, software is getting more and more complex these days, right? And the time that, and I'm sure you, you were in that time as well, right? Where we could just write a piece of software all by ourselves and it would be fine. That time is long gone, right? Now we're building uh, distributed systems with uh, multiple people, with multiple teams working on pieces where the cognitive load of all that technology that we talked earlier, earlier about, right, is too much for one person or even one team to handle. Uh, so you need a lot of collaboration to get stuff done. And it also means that you need to have ways to create sort of a shared mental model of the stuff you're working on, mm -hmm. um, not just on the technology, uh, but also with like domain experts, people who know how uh, the problem that you're solving could be solved or what the problems are that you may want to uh, solve or how something works in that domain. So getting all the knowledge together is a big challenge because in the end, right, a lot of engineers talk a different language than people who work in a certain domain. So DDD provides a lot of good ways to write the concept of a ubiquitous language of bringing that together. And uh, event storming is one of the, I think, very approachable ways to do that. But there's many, many more collaborative ways of doing that. And I think it's really good to uh, to put more and more focus on that and just create more and more tools to allow us to do that uh, in a good way. No, absolutely. Um, 
Okay, so this podcast is about legacy and about loving legacy. And we had a chat the other night about how yeah. we feel about <laughs> legacy. Because you asked me, you said to me, so yeah, what's the name of it? Oh, legacy. And I, I said, because I love it. And you said, well, I hate it. That was your response. So uh, yeah, so how do you see that? So what's the, yeah, how does legacy fit into to your daily work? I mean, the best times I've had writing software was always when you're just right, when you're thinking of new stuff, when you're writing new stuff, somehow that feels the most productive. And especially when doing it with a team of people, right? with different skill sets so you combine these skill sets and you create you get this sort of magic where you can create stuff that you could never do yourself so i think that's that's uh, really nice to be in such a situation and when you get into a situation where there's a system with a lot of history and started it somewhere and then obviously still uh, being involved in it uh, later on um, but a lot of people join that project throughout the time and obviously it's not uh, at the start, it's your baby, sort of, right? And uh, and you have total control over everything, and you can put your vision, your ideas in there. And then a bunch of years later, your vision changes, your ideas change, so you have to bring that along. Yeah, you have to be very disciplined and very structured to make sure that it stays in a sort of, in a good shape. But at some point, if you don't do that, it becomes legacy, right? And uh, legacy can have a lot of bit different meanings, but typically it means something that is not, at least how I see it is, it's a code base or a product that's not easy to work with anymore. You don't like being in it. You don't mm -hmm. uh, feel like it's uh, you're getting stuff done at, at the pace that you would like to get stuff done, right? I like to go fast. I like to, to build stuff and, and be excited about those things and not feel dragged down by a big stone that you're dragging along. So that's why I hate it, right? And that's really why I don't want to be in that situation. But to be honest, all our industry is full of it, right? Because there are so many places where we are trying to go faster and faster and agile and faster and faster. And I think a big problem is that a lot of teams do not have the discipline to then go fast, but also go quality, right? And you have to have both of those because the moment you let slip of quality and that control on architecture and all those kind of things, you end up in legacy very quickly. So even if you're, you're Ideas, oh, let's just rewrite because this, this stone is so heavy, we can't lift it anymore. Let's just uh, start from scratch. That sounds very appealing. But in a lot of cases, if you don't do something about your mindset and the way you're doing that, you're just going to end up with another stone and you're dragging around two stones. Okay, so a couple of things there. First of all, you said the quality is, is important. So I was going to ask about your approach. So typically when you meet a legacy system, First of all, what, what are the smells that it's legacy? And secondly, what would you start to think about doing to improve that situation? Yeah, it depends very much on the situation. But let's say last year I was in a, a place where uh, a clear smell that I picked up, right? Because I just jump in the project and I, I look around and to be honest, I wasn't there to fix the legacy, but I smell things, right? And then uh, one of the things I smell is, okay, this, this team is using a branching strategy that's way too complicated for what they're trying to do. There were two developers and they were having working on three releases at the same time. That's just totally crazy. Uh, and it was a, there was also a lot of meetings and stuff around that, right? To organize what goes into which release and then have it to rebranch and rebuild. Lots of, lots of ways to work. So then I go in and I say, okay, guys, let's not do this. Let's change the way we do, uh, do things. Let's just move gradually, right? Towards a more trunk-based way of working because it's just two developers there, even if we're going to add more later, let's try and get there. But we need stuff to make that happen. So one of the things they really needed is to get, there was sort of a manual testing cycle that took a week. Uh, so uh, we got someone in and they started working on a uh, test automation suite, which took a half a year, right, to get that in place. But at that point they had a, uh, let's say, fully automated regression test. So deploys to production could be done, let's say, after that ran, which was, uh, well, half an hour. So that's different from a week, right? So you 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 change the ball game completely. At that point, you get to, into a very different flow of working, and things start to go fast again, right? So it's the way you work. So it's the branch strategy, but it was also uh, the way the pipelines were set up. It was also the way the testing was done, because there was good unit testing, right? But this wasn't enough to give confidence that the thing is actually going to work, because they were having issues with stuff going or breaking every time, also because of the complexity of the branch strategy, not knowing what you're actually putting into production. So this is just one example, right? But there's just so many, yeah. uh, many others. I mean, I remember that um, in another early project, we had to replace Elasticsearch 
and we were still using a very old version of that. I uh, just uh, didn't get uh, get around to upgrading it because somehow it wasn't important as all the features were building, right? Uh, because we couldn't upgrade our Spring libraries anymore because the uh, Spring data library we used for Elasticsearch uh, couldn't be upgraded because it couldn't go talk to the old version anymore. So you sort of get this cascade of things that are holding you back. We couldn't upgrade the Java version because of that. Well, there was just so many things stacking on top of each other. So we just knew, okay, this is, we have to tackle that thing. But it was going to be a big change, right? It's not a, an easy upgrade, but we just did it. We all, or again, took half a year to do that, but we kept the whole system working all the time. Uh, we had zero downtime do deployments all throughout. We did, did deployments twice a week, pretty much. So we did that whole migration, but in such a way that we could essentially get the whole new variant up and running and, and ready and tested, et cetera, before we do the actual migration of our production uh, environment. Uh, and it also meant that because a big problem with these kind of big changes is that while you're working on the big change, which is going to take half a year, right? Somewhere halfway, there's going to be a super high priority business thing that comes by. And it means you have to go back and work on the, the actual features because it's a system that's making money, right? This legacy exactly. system is the place where where you where your business runs on. So you have to, to do stuff on it, right? Keep it relevant to your customers. To be honest, we did the migration within uh, the complete migration we did in 10 minutes. But we just prepared the whole thing in such a way that we could do that. And that worked. Wow. Okay. Well, the, the two examples you gave, a lot of your work is actually handling legacy in some way, in some form, either improving it um, or improving a process around it or having to build something which which has got a legacy component already. So I like that in that last example. Yeah, so and I still hate hate working with legacy, right? But yeah. I refuse I refuse to accept it. I think that's more the mindset, right? So I, I, free, right. I refuse to accept it as legacy. If it's there, and sometimes the decision is to uh, to rewrite it, right? If you can do that and the trade of works well for you, then that's the way, uh, and that's also the way I do it in some cases, right? But in a lot of cases, you just have to uh, to make the legacy not legacy anymore. Um, and that means bringing in discipline, bringing in ways of working that you do stuff in small steps. And even on a, on a big, uh, people call it a monolith, right? You can transform that into a modulith, like, which is uh, what you call it nowadays. Um, and in a lot of cases, just creating a good modular system that is even, that is just one deployable unit or maybe two or three, right? If you need some scalability in some places, um, is way faster than all these other things. And then creating all yeah. these small microservices. Something I was going to say, yeah, I, I completely agree with you as well. I think that's absolutely spot on. You've got to pick your horse for your course, essentially. Um, however, there's a couple of things there. Um, first of all, it is kind of inevitable these days that people want to build on Kubernetes. They want to have stuff like CV-based development, essentially. So a lot of the time where companies make a decision because it's going to be, it has to be the latest technology to attract people to that particular way. Secondly, the around the way of working. So you mentioned in order to create or get rid of legacy or control legacy, you have to be very structured in the way you work, but also you need to be structured in the way you work anyway, essentially. So it's kind of, it's not creating legacy is being structured as well as fixing legacy. So it's the same approaches essentially for just from yeah. different balls of mud or scales of balls of mud. So I think if you work on something new, you, you should also always do it in that way uh, as well, probably, right? Because uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with with a legacy which you don't want to be uh, want it to be. But still, in our industry, I mean, how many places do you see that do not have some legacy system? I think as an industry, we're we're still definitely not in control here yet. Um, and uh, there's a lot of knowledge, right, on how to do these things better, but somehow we're not managing to apply it. So that's also why I think why I'm talking at conferences and spreading this knowledge because I think it's important to help the industry to realize this and also to find ways to get it under control, right? And help people get it under control because um, we're building more and more software. And if we're not doing it the right way, we're just building a lot more legacy and I don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to work on more legacy, right? At the same time, there's all these nice shiny little toys out there and we're still engineers. We like playing with, uh, with toys, at least I do. Um, and uh, the latest and greatest stuff is always better than the old stuff. And in a lot of cases, these new toys uh, are created to solve a problem, right? Kubernetes is there to solve a certain problem as well. Uh, I just don't think it's, it's there to solve every problem. 
I mean, I've, I've worked with it and there's definitely a lot of value in, in the way stuff is there. Um, it's also way too complicated for a lot of environments, I think, right? I think the ease with which organizations now adopt Kubernetes and mm-hmm. under, underestimate its complexity, I think that's quite scary, to be honest. Um, especially if you see how cloud vendors are actually taking a lot of complexity away from you and now you're trying to get it again, right? Uh, on the other hand, you, yeah. you sort of are in control of, of a lot of areas. At least it may feel like that. <laughs> Uh, so that's, um, I always like to be in that situation as well, right? I mean, I remember that um, when we built that, that product that I was talking about long ago, when we started on that, uh, one of the big things that I really liked or the, the good choices I think we made is that we actually took everything under our own control. We didn't depend on third-party vendors or anything to uh, to help us. We made a sort of a buy versus build decision at, early on and the, the first time we did, okay, we'll just buy part of it and build another piece. And later on, yeah, that vendor was just, you know, the whole industry in that area wasn't moving at the pace that we needed. So we changed the decision and we said, okay, we're just going to build everything. Uh, so we control everything and control the evolution that we need. Um, and that really uh, played out very well for us at that point. Right? But it's a, uh, it needs to be a conscious decision. And I think in a lot of cases now, people are making decisions based on whatever shiny or whatever vendors are talking about or or whatever consultants are talking about. Oh, uh, I think it's always been like that, right? isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is, right? But uh, that's not the that's not the way it should be, right? No. Uh, you, sh- you should make uh, trade-offs based on what you really need. But yeah, that's really hard, always. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, people underestimate the value of just sticking with the stuff that you know and can handle. Uh, and that means less shiny, less toys, but stuff that you can move fast with. And that is, I think, usually quite underestimated. I'm, I'm suddenly thinking, mm. this is, you're almost describing legacy, but it's kind of optimized. It's like a, you've gone through the process of improving your system. Everyone understands how it all works. Once you've got an optimized legacy system, essentially, that's the sweet spot in some ways, because you could, everyone's familiar with it. They know what the tools are like. They know how to extend it. And, and it's also simple to deploy, and it's easy to, to get releases out. Yeah, but that's not how people experience legacy, right? So I think if you take the word legacy out, but say a well-organized structured system that people know and understand, that's not legacy, right? Because I think a big portion of legacy is that people don't understand how the system works or what it's supposed to do, or at least do, or pieces of it. There are very good reasons for using new technology on certain stuff. You really need to understand the the field. And I think that's where domain of design, again, has a good role to play, is that it helps you to understand a domain. It helps you to understand the problem space. And once you understand that, that really helps you to um, to make better decisions about the stuff that you're going to do. And maybe, right, and I think also combining product thinking with domain-driven design is really powerful space that's being explored by the community at the moment. I think that is even more powerful because then you're also starting to uh, think a lot about, okay, what's important for our users, even makes the decision more targeted and then maybe there are cases, which because I experienced them, where it's good to use some experimental technology to do something that nobody else has ever done because it's going to put you in a space where nobody is and where you can solve problems that nobody else can solve. And obviously that's, a, from a business point of view, a very good place to be. So uh, if technology helps you there, then maybe that's the, the thing you have to do, right? But then you have to be conscious that it's going to be a trade-off, right? It means you have learning curves. Or you make it an experiment. You just say it's, a mar- it's almost a marketing experiment and you throw it away. So if it doesn't work, yeah. fine, we, we, we move on fast. A lot of problems in those cases, right, is that you, people don't throw it away, right? It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's a marketing experiment, uh, but then it's somewhat successful and just lingers on and becomes another legacy stone that you have to carry along. Yeah, I, that, that links onto a nice point um, around... Exactly that. Exactly. Attempts to fix legacy. You must have seen this as well, where people have kind of come in and say, oh, this is a, like a monolith. We need to split it up. And suddenly you end up with a monolith plus a couple of microservices plus some other pieces in an attempt to do the right thing, but not carrying it through. I've seen that. I'm sure you have, too. Um, yep. It's in that at that point you're kind of screwed both ways, aren't you? Because you kind of you can get you can get a system into a point where you can't really go anywhere with it. You at that point you have to just throw it away or just leave it. You know, because it becomes a bit of everything. It's a Frankenstein. Yeah. What, yeah. How would you approach that? Well, I again, I would 
try to take the Frankenstein out of it, not accept that it's a lost cause. And sometimes it is, right? You just have to throw it away. But to be honest, I think in a lot of cases, people don't realize that you can still make it work, right? But you have to then probably make sure that you start rewriting the parts that really nobody understands anymore. Get the team, like the developers and the domain experts together and have them solve that piece together so everybody understands that part of the software anymore. And then you probably don't need the old part anymore and you can turn it off. And then you have to pick out pieces of that legacy part and uh, and chop away at it bit by bit. Just go back into that for one minute, because uh, you defined a legacy system as something which is not supportable anymore. Was that right? No, it's a, there's a bunch of definitions, right? I think Michael Feathers has a nice, nice one where he says, yes, a legacy system is just a system that doesn't have tests. Um, that I think in a lot of cases, that's the case. Yeah, a lot of people, Systems without tests uh, become legacy, but it's not necessarily the case. What I've seen so far, it's usually the point where people don't understand how a system works anymore. Uh, and it can have a lot of reasons, right? It can be because there are no tests because then, uh, or because the tests that are there are really poorly written. In some cases, it's because the people with the knowledge about the system left or some new people joined that have a very different idea about what it should be, start changing it and then only do the change halfway, you could say. So you get sort of two systems or two different ways of working in, in one. That's also what, what we talked about earlier. Systems nowadays are very complex, right? Distributed systems where multiple people are always working. Uh, it's not just one person working on it. True, this consistency is very powerful to have in a system, but it's also really hard to maintain, right? You have to be very disciplined. Um, and um, I've been in a situation why right? the, the system that I once built uh, over the years, it, it wasn't the system that I built anymore. Also, it, it didn't follow the principles that we set out at the start. I mean, we wrote all the documentation about uh, architecture principles and those kind of things that we wanted to follow, but new people join. And at some point there's multiple teams working on it. And uh, there's just no way you, you can completely control that, uh, especially if you tr try to do it like two things as documentation, because yeah, whoever finds and reads these things anyway. So I think one of the things that I'm also trying with these workshops is automated ways to enforce these things, right? So um, in the workshop, you encounter something that's called an arc unit, which allows you in your pipeline check or you compile time or test time, check that uh, the architecture that you have in mind is not violated. Uh, so these kind of things really help to also help juniors that started on a, on a project or even other, uh, other coders that have a different ID to to understand why these things are there, right? Because there's something that will prevent them from uh, building that version of the code if they if they don't follow the the intention. So yeah. again, it comes, it comes down to discipline again, um, and that's that's hard, <laughs> and also not a comfortable place to be, right? Because uh, discipline takes effort. Uh, just doing your thing is a lot easier. Exactly, and then people move on as well. That's the thing. If there's a there's a churn, continuous churn of developers, which can happen a lot of times, a lot of places, then there's disruption, and then disruption means that things slow down. Of course, when che t teams change, and then pressure comes on to deliver, and suddenly ADRs, what are ADRs? You know, so it's it, yeah, it's that social element of coding which is so important, but very much not just the not, not just the collaboration, but also the way that we pass on information. In fact. Something you said about writing documentation or reading documentation. I mean, that's the thing that, that I always do. I always try and find the documentation as soon as I start a job. I'm trying to learn myself from the code, how, how the, what the architecture is. And how, how many places do I turn up and I say, well, where's, where's a picture of, the, of, of an architecture view? And no one can show me anything that's even up to date yep. or relevant updates in the last year. That's surely got to be the starting point for anyone coming into the system. But uh, everyone learns differently. That's, that, that's fine. Yeah, and I, so we talked about visual uh, stuff earlier, right? Yeah. yeah. Visual, I think, is always super important to have at least one visual in your in your project, right? That it represents your architecture and um, right the high level overview of what the system is supposed to be, how it's supposed to work, just the uh, the high level mental model, so that everybody is able to talk about it uh, and understand it in in a similar way. If you have something like that and you make sure that you constantly use it in the discussions that you have, you're going to keep it up to date because when you're having a discussion about it, you're changing something, you you know, you have to change it. Right. So, uh, and the trick there is, I think to, um, at Luminous, we have our Luminous way of working, uh, which sort of a document that we try to help everyone here with to sort of 
uh, have some principles and guidelines to follow on how you do these things. And we have a section on documentation there, which says try to write the minimal amount that you can right that, that you need, but that you are sure that you can keep up to date over time. Because uh, in a lot of cases, I see people producing just tons and tons of documentation, but yeah, there's no way you're going to keep that up to date. So um, another approach I really like is taking uh, like visualizations out of the actual reality, which is the, the code, right? Um, so nowadays there's more and more tooling that allows you to do that. But that's way more useful than having something that you have to maintain manually. Well, indeed, yeah, I think that's that's important as well. I was going to ask, have you used C4 diagrams at all? Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm to be honest, I'm a big fan of uh, of C4. I really uh, um, like that concept. Um, Do you find and- that um, that people look at you funny there? Because like when I, because I'm basically C4 makes complete sense to me as well. And the context, the, the, the top level box is the most important part of any anything for me there. Yeah. Um, I think it's the most important part of anything. I, mean, I, I will just stick with the context for you, to be honest. I don't really want to go into components or anything even. But, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, but I get looked at weird now because I kind of got, I draw these blobs and I've had people, actors and stuff, and I say, this is our system. And people go, well, there's, where's the where's the architecture? Where's the interface here? Where's the network? Where's the whatever? And I'm like, don't forget forget about that. We don't need to worry about that. We need to know the actors. We need to know the systems, and that's it. You know, these blobs. Um, and I kind of like, I'm kind of second guessing myself now because I go into meetings and I present this, and they're kind of like, they've already raised all these questions at a detailed level. And I'm like, I'll, I'll have a meeting with them. I'll say, listen. That's not important. All we need to understand is the interactions at this level, and then we can dig in, into the details later. Or maybe we don't need to. That's the point. Yeah, and I think like C4 does it pretty well, right? And you have the system level, and that, uh, at the container level is usually quite useful still as well. But the focus there is on giving you the context of where your system operates in, right? All the things that are outside it. Um, and I think C4 does it on a like more technical level, or you still see the actors. So it, uh, it forces you, if you do it right, to uh, to put a lot of details in there, right? You you for every system and for every every container there, you you describe its purpose, right? You describe its relation to other pieces. You describe the kind of technology that it's using. But it gives usually a lot of information already. Um, at least when you come into a project, I think a lot of I, I see a lot of my colleagues also they create these kind of diagrams when they come into a project, just to get an understanding and they enrich it, right? They give it back to the project to make sure it it stays there. I actually had a talk with Simon Brown the last year uh, at one of the conferences where we ran into each other. And um, so I was playing with the idea of, of wouldn't it be nice if we can have this sort of always up-to-date documentation also on that level, right? And uh, so I had a discussion with him about it. And the outcome that we came to is that, yeah, well, actually, the real value of that kind of high-level diagram is not so much having an up-to-date version of it. It is drawing it together with the people working on it, right? And that act of drawing it yeah, you sort of bring up the knowledge from the group, right? You get all the knowledge about how the system works together and you create a shared mental model. And uh, I think a lot of collaborative techniques also in domain of design do that. And they, uh, I think that's that's the bigger value, just not just the image, but the mental model that you create together. Um, so to automate it wouldn't do that justice, right? Because you wouldn't be able to, to have that collaboration going. So uh, um, yeah, I think... Uh, that's also important to realize. Some diagrams you just have to draw, uh, and that's fine. Uh, you can't automate everything. There's actually a lot of value in not automating it. Exactly. It drives a conversation. That's the whole point, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so apart from C4, because C4 has some, is it the Structurizer tool or the framework as well, which allows yeah. you to... Um, yeah, really cool stuff. Uh, there's, some, there's some more kind of uh, loose... Loosely coupled ones, I suppose you could say, which allows you to just draw the diagrams without having to set up relationships and stuff, which is cool. Any other tools that you would recommend as well, or, mo- or models um, that you use? Well, yeah, so I think in this space, like giving context about a system, what I think is really useful to draw a context map, like from DDD, which essentially is like a high level context overview of a system, but then more focused on the communication patterns between systems and especially also between teams, right? because uh, context maps are a lot about the organizational structure that you're dealing with. Um, and then you draw them from the point of view from the team, right? And then looking outward, what are the the other systems and teams that we're, uh, that we're dealing with and how what is our relationship there? And 
uh, just being aware of that, being aware of what relationship you have. Like, are you downstream? Are you upstream? Uh, are you going separate ways? Like all these things are important to understand. Or if, do we have a shared kernel? These kind of things are important to understand because it gives you a mode of operating uh, on that relationship. And uh, being aware of that is really important. And I think in a lot of cases, people are not aware of it, right? So, and that leaves them to maybe communicate or expect things that are not to be expected of that relationship. So creating these contact maps is, uh, is I think, very useful as well. So I say, yeah, uh, a high-level C4 diagram and a context map. I think those were would be the, the good ones to get a, a feel for uh, how, uh, well, would I, when I would onboard on a, on a team, it would be lovely if we would have these things. And then I think the other thing you really need to have is like a business model canvas for the part of the, uh, the, the part that you're working on to understand, okay, what is the business here trying to do? Why are we actually building this system? So these kind of things, just to, to give you an understanding on the, the business domain that you're working in. Don't see them being shared in a lot of places. But yeah, I think it would be great if every project would have those. Yeah, you'd hope so. But yeah, again, I think the, the temptation is always for everybody to prove their worth on any project. And people who are kind of developers, or either your developers or your BAs or whatever role you play, project managers, everyone wants to show that they know stuff. So they, they want to break out the tools, they want to break out the low-level stuff and get diving on the details and show activity through busy work a lot of the time. And this kind of helicopter view context view kind of stuff is it's rare it's rare to see and it's it's a shame i think because yeah all the stuff that we've talked about the yeah finding legacy building legacy before even yeah. you built anything you know comes through rushing ahead a lot of the time rather than taking a bit of time stepping back and just saying okay what are we trying to achieve here and can we agree on that at least through this collaborative process and then again yeah. we don't want to get the impression because that that's also an impression that a lot of people have from domain driven design that it means you start to do a lot of design up front, uh, but actually that's that's still not what you do. You really try to do it iteratively. You like you do it small. You do a bit of thinking there, but then you try to bring it into practice and see if it works, because then you'll learn whether it's actually the case. So awesome. uh, uh, definitely a bit more thinking up ahead, but not too much. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, Nico, this has been brilliant. I will, I will share a few things I think with our listeners. Um, you mentioned this thing, the Arc uh, plugin um, in the pipeline. Arc unit. Arc units, yeah. So maybe you can yeah. share the link with me for that. That would be great. Yeah, sure, we'll it's, do. It's a, it's a pl- that, that sounds really interesting. I want to dive into that myself. I'll share a couple of other links about various things, including the, the DDD meetup and, and DDD. That would be great. Yeah. I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining me. It's been really good fun. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much to Nico for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. I will include in the show notes links to Nico's speaking engagements and his workshops and Please join me again next time on the next episode of Loving Legacy. Until then, goodbye and good luck.